This could be the secret why some drivers beat you. I broke down all the driving styles in motorsports and the bad habits that come with them. To back up my research, I coached thousands of drivers both in the simulator and in real life, including pro drivers, and even interviewed Formula 1 drivers about their technique in motorsports and how they built it and perfected it over their early careers. Do you know what your driving style is? Most drivers say that they have a unique style of driving and that is why their setups should be different than their teammates' setups, or they prefer different cars or even different simulators. Most of you also say, or at least heard, that there is no explanation for that, that your style is personal, natural. I do agree that everyone has their style at some point, but to think that you cannot change that is just wrong. And let me explain to you why this is huge. If you don't understand what your driving technique is and what you should fix in it, you will make bad habits even worse. Your style depends a lot on how you got into racing in the first place. Was it racing games, karting, autocross, track days, off-road driving? All these categories end up building your technique from the ground up, each in a very different way. And the truth I want you to never forget after watching this video is the first learned habits are the most difficult to break. Whatever you start driving in your career will shape your biggest tendencies and habits that could carry over your entire life. But I realized something extremely interesting from the best drivers in the world. The complete race driver does not have only one style of driving. He or she will quickly adapt to what style the car requires to drive on the limit. When coaching in real life, I had the chance to work with drivers who were coming from different backgrounds and I picked up the patterns and differences on how they deal with driving at the limit. I was able to coach them in the simulator and change their driving completely in real life. These were drivers coming from carts, from sim racing and even from off-road dirt driving and the difference in their inputs was screaming at me. Let's analyze a little bit all the styles and discuss improvement tips specifically to each style to help you understand and diversify your driving technique and adapt to as many cars as possible. The chapters as always are listed in the description. If you have a team, watch the entire video so you can help your teammates identify and polish their styles or of course just send the video to them so you don't have to do all the coaching yourself. And of course, slap the like if you value the content. I won't ask you to subscribe yet though, just later. Drivers who start their careers in carts develop a natural craving for full body sliding, where the four tires are doing the work consistently and through oversteer and lots of steering correction, they are able to maintain the car on the ideal racing line and even go on and off the racing line when fighting for position, all that while maintaining that full body slide. Full body sliding or neutral steer is the key to understanding karting driving style. If you have watched my video about neutral steer, you already know that having both the fronts and rears sliding a little bit at the same time is ideal for maintaining maximum lateral force and improving lap times. Since carts are already quite oversteering naturally, the young drivers simply have to deal with it early in their careers. In some low-powered carts like indoor carts, you don't even need to brake in most corners since just the oversteer from turn-in already scrubs speed off as you go deep into the corner. Feeling the rear tires sliding a bit as you turn into the corner is the fastest way to drive these small machines, and this sensation becomes their own reference of when a car is going fast or not, even when they move to bigger cars. In iRacing, for example, when I coach kids who come from karting, they naturally become super fast in open-wheel Formula cars since they're able to deal with oversteer with quick and agile corrections on the steering. This requires that your hands become sensitive to the response of the steering wheel, or force feedback, to respond quickly to changes in grip on the front tires to keep the rears sliding the perfect amount. Top drivers use this technique to the extreme, sometimes turning into the corner while it looks like they're not even turning the steering, since the cars already want to rotate very easily under braking. The Formula 1 driver I interviewed told me the best karting drivers were the ones who had the cleanest driving, where their steering inputs were minimal. 
without jerking the wheel around too much and focusing on the best and cleanest exit possible since the cars don't have a lot of power and the slightest change in minimum speed could mean many tens of a second. I developed concepts like active counter shear, passive counter shear and light hands technique in the motor racing checklist online course, but that's a little bit too advanced and too long to describe in this video. Regarding weight transfer, since the cars already want to rotate naturally, karting racers tend to worry more about moving the weight back to the rear tires than the other way around. This might be confusing, but it's actually quite simple. You need to concentrate more weight on the front tires if the car is under shiri to provide more support to the front tires and make the car rotate more. But since the cars already want to rotate, you don't have to worry too much about shifting the weight forward more than the natural braking you have to do anyways to decelerate the cart before the corners. On top of that, most carts only have rear brakes, so that makes them even more oversteering under braking. I always say you have two braking functions. One is to decelerate and the other is to rotate, but they overlap. The car doesn't know if you want to slow the car down or if you want to get more rotation. Both happen at the same time. And that is why breaking into corners at the limit in carts is so tricky. You have to be extremely delicate on the steering to make the car rotate just enough. Just a little bit of excessive steering force on the braking will make the cart quickly oversteer and spin. So the car drivers are mostly worried about releasing the brakes at the right time to send some weight back to the rear tires and keep the cart stable. This is what I call inducing understeer with brake release. And again, it would take too long to explain in detail in this video. What about moving from carts to cars? When cart drivers move to big cars, the main difficulty that shows up is dealing with how lazy and understeery the big cars can be. The weight brings a lot of inertia with it and getting the body to rotate takes a lot more patience and a different rhythm. The rotation in race cars needs to start slow and build up in a much more noticeable manner than carts and cart drivers need to create a new, slower flow in their steering inputs. Also, the trail braking in big cars can be as much as five times slower than in carts, and that transforms our expectations from the car. Instead of waiting for it to rotate naturally, we need to force that rotation to happen. And this brings us to the opposite rotation management skill, inducing oversteer. Now, instead of having to worry about moving the weight back to the rear tires very quickly to prevent oversteer, we need to maintain a little bit of that weight on the front tires to prevent understeer. This is not always the case though. Depending on setup, cars can still be very aggressive and oversteery, and the skills developed in karting will be incredibly useful. But even with oversteer, in big cars, these motions take longer to happen than in carts. The spins will be much slower and might be easier to catch than in carts. In real life, the F1 driver I interviewed told me that it can take up to a full year to adapt from carts and formula cars to heavy GT cars. If a professional driver at the pinnacle of motorsports said that, it shows how patient we should be when practicing in new categories until the results show up. Cars are like carts in slow motion. Almost everything that happens will be the same, except that the time it takes for each effect to take place is five times longer. The suspension takes longer to compress and extend. In fact, you don't even have suspension in cars, so the compression and extension effects come solely from the tires. The car takes longer to decelerate, takes longer to rotate, and takes longer to accelerate. You need to adapt your input to synchronize your expectations and the car's capabilities. The biggest difference will be the brake release. And here's the thing, the most common mistakes amongst all drivers in any simulator, racing game and also in real life is to release the brakes too quickly to 0% and then just rely on the natural balance of the car expecting it to turn a lot while still increasing the steering. This is what we call coasting, having zero brakes mid-corner while still turning more and more. This generally causes more understeer than necessary and you get a lot less rotation than you think. And then on exit, what do you do? 
you get back on power aggressively while still trying to get the rotation and you end up losing the rear and losing all your exit speed. An ideal GT driving style has the least amount of coasting possible where the driver carries the brakes deep into the minimum speed point, which I also call the maximum rotation point in the motor racing checklist, and then connects that tiny remaining amount of brakes with the throttle. This is when the game changes to you, when you connect the brakes with the throttle with no gap. The Formula 1 driver I interviewed told me he brakes as much as possible into the corner to get the maximum rotation he can without micro-locking the inside tires. You will keep the car rotating a healthy amount and the exit will be straighter with less steering necessary and a much better exit speed. But without the next step, you're neglecting a major part of the equation. The second biggest mistake when driving cars is turning in too quickly when there's braking involved. I'm gonna make this as simple as it gets. So open a notebook or something in your phone and write this down as a rule. Whenever you're braking into the corner, you should turn in slowly. Whenever you're just lifting or accelerating, you can turn in more quickly. I won't go too much in detail about this rule because this video is getting out of control and too long. So let's go to the next driving styles. Oh, and I guess this is the time to ask you to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss these lessons in the future. Low down force versus high down force styles. This is another dangerous factor when developing your driving habits. If you start driving high downforce cars where the cornering grip increases with speed, you will develop a natural tendency to turn in more quickly into corners. This way, you build more circular arcs or U-shaped lines where the radius is quite similar from entry to mid corner at the minimum speed. But on lower downforce cars, the cornering grip is limited at higher speeds and you need to decrease the speed more and more before the grip shows up. That means you should turn in more slowly while braking quite hard and trail braking deep into the corner, getting more and more rotation when the car gets closer to the minimum speed. This forces you to have a slower steering input initially and then turn in more and more and more when deep into the corner which creates a much more v-shaped line where the radius at the minimum speed is much smaller than on turn in these corner entry differences are the most important thing to change when moving between these two types of cars let me tell you a story i was coaching a driver in real life while being on the passenger seat with her i noticed right away that she had such a natural talent for dealing with oversteer what really impressed me was how she was able to correct oversteer to such a microscopic level while keeping the car in the neutral steer state for a long time. This is the moment where you feel that the driver has a natural talent, a gift, right? But let me already stop you there. I don't believe in talent and gifts. I believe in preparation and early skill development, especially skills that transfer from different domains. So there had to be something there behind that masterful driving. After this session, we got out of the car and started discussing the improvement points. But when I mentioned her skill with oversteer, this is what she told me. Well, I'm a dirt oval track driver, so I do spend a lot of time going sideways. Always there is a reason. Her skills from having all four tires working while having a full body slide in the dirt for the entire corner transferred masterfully to road driving and now Alana went on to win the Formula Women competition in the UK to get a GT4 seat. So congrats Alana! Dirt or off-road drivers would rarely tolerate driving a super understeery car. The sensation would be right away that they are incredibly slow. They need to feel the rear tires working and although they do it in big amounts when driving off-road, that skill can easily be polished to small levels of sliding that match the slip angle of road tires. As a coach, I always say that you learn a technique by exaggerating it first and then shaving it back to detail. This is the most efficient way to learn anything. While exaggerating, you feel the difference, it becomes clear to you. Then, you add in the component of precision and subtlety to make the technique almost unnoticeable to others. That's when you really mastered it. So 
Dirt drivers are pretty much learning how to master oversteer and neutral steer by doing it in big amounts off-road. And when they move to road driving, they are already one step ahead than everyone else and they can just polish that quickly. Before we go to the fourth domain, always remember, the first learned habits are the most difficult to break. That also means that the first learned skills are most likely going to be your biggest strength. Although I'm describing the styles themselves, pay attention to the one you started. This will be the biggest source of all your habits, good and bad ones. Did you already slap that like button by the way? Racing games and sim racing. This one is getting more and more important as sim racing dominates the sport with more and more sim racers joining the sport in real life after having started in racing games and simulators with absolutely no real life background myself included. Racing games can vary drastically in car behavior, equipment used, and competitiveness. The truth you're about to hear is going to be difficult to swallow depending on your background, but racing games make a difference. Even the arcadey ones. Even if you start playing with a joystick on a PlayStation or on the keyboard, there will be transferable skills from the most basic form of racing games that can make the difference in the future if you become a real-life driver or sim racing competitor. Don't get me wrong, just like any other domain in real life, you can also create bad habits from racing games that could transfer to sim racing and real-life driving and cause bigger problems in the future. If you're always dropping the brakes from 100% to 0% and coasting all over the place and the game doesn't punish you with loss of lap time, for example, you will most likely solidify that habit and struggle in more realistic simulators or even real life. Adaptation is always gonna be key. And one more time, just to make sure you don't forget, the first learned habits are the most difficult to break. As soon as you move up and get a simulator, a steering wheel and pedals, try to quickly adapt and learn the fundamentals to create healthy first habits. Simulators and racing games can vary drastically as you can have card simulators, racing games with some absurd physics, and more serious simulators trying to mimic real life as much as possible. All the other domains I mentioned in this video can also be experienced through simulators and racing games. Most racing games feel like the car is on rails and you don't get much oversteer, which can make you create a habit of abusing the front tires too much and not even thinking about the rears, except when they snap away in understeer, snap over sheer moments on corner exit. If you're moving from racing games to simulators, learn how to induce more rotation with trail braking and your lap times will improve drastically. If you moved from a game or sim to another and you got destroyed by the competition, there's a reason for this. And if you don't figure it out fast, you'll keep losing and feeling frustrated. Let me point out some main differences between some of the most famous sims and racing games. Acero Corsa Competizione and iRacing are two of the most famous simulators out there. The main difference between them relies on one thing, braking iRacing simulates braking in a way that allows you to go over the threshold limit and beyond, causing loss of grip, and when the car does not have ABS, total lockup right away. In pretty much all cars in iRacing, you will be slow if you brake to 100% pressure and keep it there, even with ABS. Without ABS, if you do that, you won't even finish a lap. ACC allows and requires you to brake 100% keep it there and sometimes even turning into the corner while maintaining 100% and then quickly dropping it to close to 0% and doing some micro braking here and there to correct the balance of the car between 1 and 10% braking. This can work in real life if you have a very good ABS system like in modern GT3 cars, but please don't try this in a real car without ABS. I felt iRacing transferred my skills to real life seamlessly as I never broke too hard or dropped the brakes too fast, mostly keeping the weight controlled all through my left foot. When coaching in real life, drivers who came from ACC had way too aggressive inputs and upset the car a lot more, 
while drivers from iRacing had a much smoother control of the car. ACC drivers were significantly slower. My experience coaching in real life was not too extensive though, so be skeptical with this information and always test things out and look for more information. Acero Corsa 1 also has a similar 100% braking approach, even for cars without ABS. Gran Turismo 7 also accepts 100% braking in most places and cars, and also accepts to activate ABS in cars that don't natively have them. If you're moving from iRacing to ACC, make sure you're smashing those brakes to 100% and trusting the ABS until quite deep into the corner. Trail braking is still a thing in ACC, but it happens more quickly and to a lower minimum pressure mid-corner. Within the same simulator, you can also have different driving styles of course, like moving from a low downforce to a high downforce car, or from a light and responsive car to a heavier and softer car. So if a car rotates too much, learn how to control it. If a car does not want to rotate, learn how to induce it. The top drivers will identify and deal with the personality of the car to ensure the car is rotating as much as possible without losing control. More rotation means higher minimum speed, which means less time spent in the corners and better lap times. The main point from this video is to be aware of your roots and identify strengths and weaknesses in your driving to know what to focus on. If you don't know your weaknesses and keep repeating them, they will get worse and worse. Since you stayed until the end of this video, I'm gonna give you a discount coupon to the Motor Racing Checklist, my online course that teaches so much more that you cannot even imagine. If this video inspired you to go practice more, subscribe to this channel and I will be posting a lot more videos with more technique tips in the next few days. See ya!